At the sound of your voice, you are able to create matter. God, that you are faithful. Lord, as we, as we think and sing through this song, the one who's able to move mountains, the one who's able to shake prison walls, God, help us to remember that you are faithful even Though things might look dark, things might look grim, things might not even turn out the way that we want them to, Lord, help us to trust that you are faithful. God, that you are working all things together. God, that you are good. Lord, that, we, that in the good times and the bad times, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, but God, even in the times when it seems like everything around us is falling apart, Lord, help us to worship you in those times because you are faithful. You are good. Lord, help us to trust you. Lord, help us to fill our minds with your, with your word so that in those times of difficulty, it is your word that points us back to you, Lord, and makes what seems so difficult and hard and challenging, makes it easier to give it to you, to trust you with it. Lord, speak to us tonight through, through Brendan as he opens your word, where we ask that the Holy Spirit would take your word and move it in our hearts. God, help us to examine ourselves tonight in light of your word. And Lord, help us to, to trust you with our lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Good to see all of you. If you got a handout, that's surprising because there is no handout. So... Um, I didn't do a handout. I did do a fancy slideshow, so 
Maybe that'll make up for it. But turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, call my wife to tell her I'm, I'm teaching tonight, and she's like, ooh, what are you teaching about? And I said, well, we're going to talk about respectable sins. And she's like, ooh, I love that. And I'm like, why? <laughs> this isn't a fun topic. And Well, I just like when I hear preaching on it. And I'm like, well, hopefully you like tonight, but I mean, I'm not going to. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to try to handle this topic tonight. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let's pray before we go any further tonight. Father, we are so thankful that we are here, that you have placed us here tonight, that, Lord, your word can be opened before us, that we got to sing praises to you, and, Lord, now that we get to worship uh, through the teaching of your word, God, I just pray that you'd help me tonight to cover, a, in my mind, a difficult topic, but, Lord, help us all to just hear what your word has to say, Lord, how to um, see these sins in our life, Lord, that we may repent of them and walk in the grace and forgiveness of Jesus and um, the freedom we have, God, that um, we'd all just, not just be down in ourselves after hearing this tonight, Lord, but that we'd be encouraged by what your son has done for us. So we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So common, I think, in church culture to, we can point very well at the sins of society. Abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, murder, those white collar, Wall Street, finance crimes, sin. But then we look at our sin and we can virtually just not even look at it, not even talk about it. It's easy to condemn and then ignore our sins. What, what kind of sins, though? Because if someone here murdered someone tonight, sin. I'm talking about gossip, lack of self-control, pride, envy, the sins that you don't really have people over your house for dinner, and then they're like, hey, you're, you're a gossip. It's just not dinner conversation. But the truth of Scripture is, is all sin is serious because all sin is a breaking of God's law. First John 3, verse 4, everyone who makes the practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It doesn't qualify which sins. It doesn't give a footnote for, well, except these sins. It's just all sin. The Bible doesn't make a distinction between that of a murderer of a person and that who runs a red light. They are both sinners. So the, the respectable sins, you may have even heard of it, the acceptable sins, it's those sins that, that we tolerate in our lives, but in God's eyes, they are still quite serious. And one author, he says, even though believers' hearts have been renewed, even though we have been freed from the absolute dominion of sin, even though God's Holy Spirit dwells within our bodies, sin still lurks within us and wages war against our souls. It is the failure to recognize the awful reality of this truth that provides the fertile soil in which our respectable or acceptable sins grow and flourish. So my, not goal, but it ended up being a goal is hopefully as the night goes on, you grow more uncomfortable and as more of your sins keep coming up on the screen that we'll just all enjoy our time together. So, <laughs> so the first one, ungodliness. Um, so the same author argues that this sin could be the root of all sins. He wouldn't actually believe that pride is the root of all sins, but that this one is. Now, I, I talked with Pastor because, well, we've all heard for years that pride is the root of all sin. But what about this guy's opinion? Well, we both disagree with him, but we still think this is a sin that is worth mentioning because I don't think as believers we tend to think we are ungodly. In fact, 
We are called to be godly. We're called to live godly. So it's that paradox for godly and ungodly at the same time. Like, what, what are we talking about? And so we're not atheists. We're not wicked people. We attend church, avoid the, the big sins, and lead respectable sins. So are believers to some extent ungodly? Well, Romans 1 Paul writes, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now you see there's a distinction between ungodliness and unrighteousness. And I don't think we, we see ourselves as ungodly, but one commentator says the state of believing in God while adopting a lifestyle which seems to deny this, believers are warned to guard against ungodliness. So you could define it as, as living one's everyday life with little or, or no thought of God or of God's will or of God's glory, that it's of one's dependence on God. No thought whatsoever. Someone could, could live a life respectable, maybe even honored by those around them, and yet still be ungodly. They might, they might be friendly. They might be hospitable, but yet they're still considered ungodly. And there's probably, I'd assume, times in all of our lives where there are hours or days that we just do not think about the things of the Lord. We give no thought to Him. We make choices without depending on what God has to say about the matter. And yet James says in chapter 4, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For there you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. James doesn't condemn making plans. We all make plans, but what does he condemn? is that they don't acknowledge their dependence on God. Paul's prayer to the believers in Colossians. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Look how God-centered that prayer was. Yet does, does your prayer life reflect a, a, this God-centered concern for God's will, for God's glory in the world? I mean, we express our dependence on God when we, we pray for this person, we pray for that prayer request, but is that all our prayer life is? It's just the supplication without the adoration, without the confession, without the thanksgiving we're just supplication supplication like is is that our prayer life or is it to be all of them our goal in the pursuit of godliness should be to grow more in our conscious awareness that every moment of our lives is lived in the presence of god that we are responsible to him that we depend on him ungodliness can be so all-encompassing that we have to identify that the areas in our life we give no concern to God. You may go to church every time the doors are open. You may be someone who, who prays before you do anything with money, but every other area of life, you, you do nothing. You don't ask God for help. You don't depend on him for those areas, and yet all of our lives should be God every area. First Timothy 4, I have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. And like our, our, our passage we just read, 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Our lives should reflect our, our need for God. Sin 1. We got a few more, few more to go. Second sin we have is anxiety. So, 
A pastor looked through the New Testament to see the different instances where Christian character traits were either, they were either taught or they were either uh, shown through, through a story or something. Doing, doing some of my own searching, faith, love, joy, peace, the, the fruit of the Spirit was very well taught and some demonstrated this, uh, putting others before self. In this pastor, he saw that love was taught the most often. He saw that humility was taught the second most often. The third one, any guesses? What? I, I lost it. What did you say? Pride? Pride? No. <laughs> I'm glad you guessed, though. I'm, someone else say? Faith. faith. I'll use a synonym. Trust, right? The, the, the trust in God. This was taught 13 times or seen in the New Testament. Now, the opposite of trust would be what? Disbelief. What did you say? Yeah, doubt. Anxiety, right? Anxiety would be the opposite. The opposite, anxiety or frustration. Now turn with me to Matthew 6. Because this is one of the passages we may go to in the when facing anxiety. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. You've probably read this several times. Jesus uses the word anxious six times. If you have the NIV, they use worry instead of anxious. But he says there in verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And Paul picks up on this same kind of thing in Philippians 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. When we say it to people, don't, don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry. We're, we're trying to be encouraging. We're trying to help whoever we're speaking with to get through whatever the situation may be. But when Jesus or Paul says it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit found in Scripture... It carries the weight of a moral command. Jesus, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. What did Paul say? Do not be anxious. When we read something in the Bible of do this or don't do this, what happens when we do the opposite? We sin. So if he says do not be anxious, anxiety is therefore a sin. Being anxious is a sin, a distrust in God. Now, this passage in Matthew 6, if you keep going to verse 26, what does he say? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Are we not of more value than the birds of the air? And Peter, in his letter, carries the same idea, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But if someone you love came to you and said, I don't trust you. I don't think you really care for me. And this is, this is a spouse. This is a, a sibling. This is a, well, you may believe it as a sibling. Uh, your best friend, right? They came and said this to you. I don't think you would just, you wouldn't just be shocked. You would be offended. And yet, what, what is it when we do this to God, when we don't trust him, when we grow anxious over our, our circumstances, our, our situation? Anxiety is not trusting in the providence of God in our lives. A promise, like um, Kim looked at a few, a few months ago, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Being anxious, this promise here, you don't believe it. You don't think it's true. You don't think all things work together for good. But I think, I don't think this is new. Believers have struggled, had a difficulty to accept that God does, in fact, orchestrate events 
for our good that nothing surprises God. The, the circumstance, the event that's happened recently that may have caught you off guard did not catch God off guard. It, it doesn't mean that God is losing control. He is very much in control. There, there's probably a group of people in here, if I asked, if you're, if you're the, the person who is just anxious all the time, just things can sometimes get you in a place where you're, you're worried, you're, you're struggling. You'd be like, that's me, right here. Then there's probably another group. On the other side, you're like, I don't really get anxious. I don't live anxious, but there are moments where I am anxious. I think I was talking to Jim about it earlier. Um, one of my like, anxious moments is airports. There's the, the anxiety of getting in, carrying all this luggage, which I do not travel well. I pack too much, so that's a problem. Uh, getting onto the plane, flying, I mean, somehow airplanes are the safest way to travel. Doesn't really feel like it, but I can get anxious in those things. And I'm sure there are things in this room that, that you guys would tell me makes you anxious. I also get anxious when things don't go according to plan. When things, I, I plan my day, and then something happens, and I'm like, oh, this changed the day. The, things will not go according to plan today. There were mornings this winter, my alarm, I didn't want to wake up, snoozed it once, found out I actually snoozed it a few times, I'm scrambling to get to work, trying to be on time. I'm rushing down the steps only to find out my car's covered in ice. I'm going to be late. So I'm behind schedule. And yet, if I believe God's sovereign, if I believe he's in control of all things, if I believe what his word says, his, that my day has been orchestrated, not according to my plan, obviously, because I'm, I'm a mess, but according to his plan. And according to his plan, I am to go through these things, not to be anxious, but to trust him, to trust what he is going to do. And I'm sure you guys have had your day planned, only to get on 270 and find out they decided to do construction in the middle of the night, and five lanes are blocked. Will I succumb to the anxiety and frustration of things not going according to my plan, or will I accept God's agenda, whatever that may be? I said worry was, you could say it's a synonym for anxiety, but it's, it's true that there's times the situation at hand is it's larger in our minds than the promise of God. And like Pastor has said often, we, we can't trust our feelings, we must go back to truth. And what does God's word say? What are the promises of God? Well, Psalm 139, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That, that's a verse worth memorizing, that when we're, when we are tempted to be anxious, we Keep saying this verse over and over and over until we believe the day has been formed for me. This circumstance is part of the plan today. And you may pray right there, this circumstance is part of your plan for my life today. God, help me respond in a way that honors you. Pray for practical wisdom on how to, how to deal with the situation. De depend on God. Don't the first sin of ungodliness, don't, don't not depend on God. Like, depend on him. Ask him for help. Depend on him in every situation. So ungodliness, anxiety. If those two, you're like, I haven't done those. Maybe this one then. You, discontentment. If if anxiety is the, the fear of uncertainty over the future, whether short or long-term, discontentment often arises 
from the ongoing or, or unchanging circumstances. Now, I think Scripture speaks of, of a good discontentment to have. If you turn one page, you're still in Matthew 6, Matthew 5. If you go to verse 6, what does it say there? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. All right, without the Holy Spirit in you, we have a problem. How can you hunger and thirst and be satisfied? How can I hunger for a cheesecake and be satisfied that I had a cheesecake? They don't make quite sense, right? What, what is the writer here trying to say? I think Scripture speaks of a holy discontentment. That when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will satisfy us. But then we're going to grow to hunger and thirst for more. And what's God going to do? He's going to satisfy us. And we're going to grow to hunger and thirst even more. And we're going to be satisfied. I think that is a great, holy discontentment to have. Now outside of that, there's not much room. This section, the, the sinful discontentment, normally an unfulfilling, a low-paying job, wanting, wanting to get paid more, or a job that's fulfilling, singleness well into midlife or beyond, the inability to bear children, an unhappy marriage, physical disabilities, continual poor health. And I'm sure there's other circumstances here in the room that, that causes you to be discontent. And I know in my own walk with the Lord, there's times it was just, I was discontent at where I was at I'm in college. I believe God was calling me to preach. I, I had my degree picked out in pastoral studies, yet all my friends seemed to be in, in the worship degree program. And we traveled together and they all could sing. Not me. And we're at, I, we travel together, they're all singing on pitch. I'm the one singing off key, making a joyful noise to the Lord. We'll just put it that way. And some days I wish God had called me not to preach, but to sing, because singing was cool. Singing was, preaching when everyone went to sleep. Singing was when everyone was most spiritual. That, their hands are in the air, preaching, their heads are down. Hands are in the air, heads are down. Like. <laughs> but like any sin, what must we do? Combat it with Scripture. John 17, 17, what does Jesus say? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So go back to that Psalm 139 passage. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, and yet there was none of them. As God is, knows our days, he's, he's known them before we did, knows the circumstances, that God has given me the, the circumstances as, as part of my life at, and part of his overall plan for my life. I am who I am to best accomplish God's plan because God has set that to be so. We must remember that God does nothing or allows nothing without a purpose. You may be discontent with the way you look. In verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I was not always happy with my red hair. Red hair meant skin cancer, more sunscreen, and more anesthesia. Those are facts. It, I was not always Happy, and yet, Psalm 139, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That's an incredible thought for each one of us. That we are knitted together. That, that, that word is like, it's a personal, involved statement. That God has made each one of us the way we are because this is the way to fulfill God's purpose in our life. And we have two options. Trust God believing his plan, believing that this is what he has for us. His plan is better than anything we can come up with. His plan is, at the end of the day, 
We want to please God and not ourselves. Or we can turn from God's plan, go our own way, in our own path. And the Bible is very clear that is not a good path. And the, the, there's still this application here that we are still invited to pray for our circumstances, to pray for what we are discontent about, to ask God for help. And I know tonight I could, probably strike, I could probably strike a nerve with some of you about the things I'm saying, but the, the encouragement here that I hope is God knows your situation. God knows what you're struggling with. God knows what you desire, and he wants to hear from you. He wants you to depend on him. He wants you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, the Lord can help you be content in this life. For all of us, to be a glass half full kind of people and not a glass half empty. Looking at everything we don't have, but going into this next sin, not thankful we're just going to keep, keep going. Is unthankfulness a word? Okay. Because Grammarly didn't say so. It sounds weird. I've never seen the word. Anyway, unthankfulness or lack of gratitude, whichever phrase suits you better. How many of you have heard the story of the ten lepers in, in the gospel? Right? You could tell me the story. The Ten lepers see Jesus. One of them screams out, Lord, heal us. What does he tell them? Go see the priest. Why go see the priest? Offer the sacrifice. He's the one that can tell them that you're cleansed. Right? So they go, and then we're not told how this happens. You can imagine the ten guys that something's falling off. The, the, the scaliness is going away. They're coming back to their normal selves. They're excited. They're, they're thankful. And they... Nine of them go their, their way. Nine of them go and back to life as normal. The one of them, which the one, what, what was special about him? Samaritan. One of those people. But he tells, he tells Jesus, and what does he tell you? Thank you. And Jesus is asking, we're not ten cleansed. In the story, I, I remember initially hearing it thinking, how could the nine do that? And yet how often in our life are we the nine who are not thanking God? We were not just diseased. We were spiritually dead. We were not just to be away from the healthy people. We were enemies of God. But Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. How often do you give thanks to God for the salvation you possess? Today, have you thought about what God has saved you from? How he delivered you from the domain of darkness into the light? You, you are no longer enslaved to sin. You are a slave of righteousness. And do you, do you give thanks to God like, like like you pray before a meal as, as quick and as fast as possible just to get to the food? Or are you truly thinking about it? In America, I think we tend to think of Thanksgiving one, one time a year. It's for November 20-something. That's when we give thanks. The other 364 days are not. And yet, scripturally, we're to give thanks all the time, and Luke writes in Acts 17, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Every breath that you have breathed in this room in the last 39 so minutes has been a gift from God. Every, every breath you have ever breathed in this life the, the skills you used at work today are the skills you're going to use when you get home. The, the home is a gift from God. The house or your apartment, the, the car you, you drove here, the, the food you, you got to eat before you came, or maybe the food you're going to eat after you leave here. Your husband or wife is a gift 
from God, the, this church that you are a part of. So often we talk to the visitors and what's their statement? We are so glad we found you. It took a while. Hopefully Google is pushing us up, up the list. But it, some of you have said like, it took a while before you found a good gospel preaching, Bible-centered church. And I think one of our young adults did some research within I think 10 miles or 20 miles, there's 52 open affirming churches. That, that's a problem. But if we are number 53 on that list on Google, that's a whole year of trying to church hop and you can't find anything. But God has driven us up on Google, on Facebook, however you found out about this place, and you came and you heard Pastor Matt. And you're like, that's good. That's a steak. A $27 Texas Roadhouse filet. That was good <laughs> preaching. You heard Nate sing. You're like, that's okay to listen to. Oh, I'm just kidding, Nate. <laughs> he sings better than I can. So, uh, which isn't hard. The ability to carry a Bible with you to church that you can read. Right, it wasn't too long ago that the church couldn't read, needed someone else to read it for them, and they're being taught all sorts of mistruths, all, all sorts of things that weren't right. But you have, you have a Bible in your hands. You, you have a Bible on your phone or iPad that you can carry everywhere. I have an audio Bible app that I can listen to different accents of guys reading the Bible. We live in a time where we have the Bible and yet you thank God that you, that you can read one, that you can have one, that you've lived in a country that offers you the freedom to, to practice what you believe. We don't know how much longer we can do that. This isn't a normal thing throughout history. Like, well, this is a very precious gift that we have been giving. Now, I think you acknowledge this in your life. I think you would say, yeah, I've, I've been given all these things, but how often do you give thanks for it? I'm reminded that I get to be a part of this great church, and there's a lot of things I get to do here that I talk to my friends, and they, they don't get that privilege. They don't, they're not in such a good spot. And when you go home tonight, when you, when you walk around your house, all the furnishings you have, all the crazy gizmos and things you've bought from Hobby Lobby and this, that, and the other. Give thanks to God for it. Looking at the, the people around you, that you have friends, that you have brothers and sisters who care for you and practice what they believe. We can take it for granted, but let us stop in all the busyness, all the craziness, having a calendar that's booked from 6 a.m. to 5.59 a.m., that you slow down and you thank God for what he's given you. But the greatest gift of all that we have been, God has given us his son, the person and work of Jesus, doing what none of us could do for ourselves. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1, I think, they were given over, handed over to their desires. One of the things mentioned was their, their lack of thankfulness. But as believers, we should know better. We, we know what we've been saved from. We, we know the truth of Scripture, what, we, what God has done for us. That should stir us to be thankful. But I think there's one more question here. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I know you're not there, so I'll just tell you, in my Bible, there's no footnote about the good circumstances. There's no footnote about the circumstances you like. It just says, give thanks in all circumstances. So that means the, the good circumstances we find ourselves in and the bad ones. And he says, give thanks. Is that through sheer willpower that we can be thankful for? We lost our job and somehow we're supposed to be thankful? Like, what, what is that? 
me. No, I think through the work of the Holy Spirit and trusting in the promises of God, like a Romans 8, 28. God, I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm thankful you're in control and not me. Through the Holy Spirit, through his enabling, we can be thankful in all circumstances. Next, next one, pride. The root of all these sins. The, the root of sin. Luke 18, 11, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Lord willing, that's none of our prayers tonight. But I think three different prides I want to, I want to address. The pride of moral self-righteousness. This Pharisee put himself above everything else. He Wow, okay. Um, I think this pride can be found anywhere. Christians are not the only one guilty of this. Politicians, your fellow workers, anyone you come in contact with. You, you can get on the news, you can get on Twitter, you can get on any form of anything to find someone who's prideful. We can do this with any such sin, such as divorce, homosexuality, abortion, drunkenness, drug use. We can, start, we can look at any of those sins and play a comparison game. I'm not that. I'm better than that. They may not get to heaven, but I will because I'm not that. But how do we fight this pride? We have to be humble. We have to seek an attitude of humility in our life, that there are believers in this room, in this church, in the world that live morally upright. They read, they pray, they obey the commands of the Lord. They aren't perfect. But instead of feeling morally superior, they give thanks to God that by his grace they have kept them from those sins. And there are plenty of men and women in this church who have, who have struggled through those sins that I have Listed, and they credit the grace of God from rescuing them out of that sin. We seek to be humble, but we also identify with this fallen society. Ezra 7.10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. He, he was committed. His life was committed to the Lord, yet even his life, He's surrounded by brokenness. He's surrounded by people struggling who are turning their back on God. But hear Ezra's prayer in Ezra 9, 6. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. The first person plural pronoun is there. Our. Not there. Not he. Not she. Our Ezra identified with the sins of God's people. And we can identify with the sins of those around us. And when we do that, that keeps us from being self-righteous. I'm better than them. No, I, I struggle with them. Um, pride of correct doctrine. Now, this thing can be a little dangerous in the church world. Everyone has a theology. We can agree on that. Everyone has an understanding of God, who they think that God is, what he has done. But the danger is that whatever your beliefs are, they're the correct beliefs. They are the only beliefs. Anyone against you is wrong. You are right. Right? So the probably correct doctrine can be played out in many ways. And what happens? You're debating someone. I'm a five-point Calvinist. I'm a 4.89 Calvinist. And the debate happens. And what? you're looking down on them. You're arrogant. Your tone becomes rather harsh. You may even think they're, they're stupid for the belief they have. I'm a young earth seven, six literal day creationists. Well, I'm a, I'm a gap theorist. Well, I think you're stupid. Like, 
N none of it helps. And Paul addresses the pride in 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Right? Like, I remember first reading this story, and I was confused. I'm, I'm thinking, what's happening? And I had someone explain to me that the Jews didn't want pork. The Gentiles did. But the Jews, even though they could and it not be a sin, they, they felt as if they were sinning. They sinned against their conscience. And Paul's response later in that chapter, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will you not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person has destroyed the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So modern day example, tattoos, dancing, dancing in, in church, music with the bass or with drums, right? M many different issues that Christian liberty can cover, that Christian liberty allows us to, if, if you want drums on stage, you can have drums. If you, if you don't want drums on stage, then, then you, you don't. But when you strive to grow in knowledge, when you're studying your Bible, getting all the, all the gold, all the things in Scripture, things you've never seen before, that growth in knowledge can puff up. But there, if there is no love, your growth in knowledge makes you become doctrinally superior to those who hold other views than you have doctrinal pride. When you, a Calvinist, decide that no one holds to the authority of Scripture like you do, then you have doctrinal pride. When you, a charismatic, decides to demean someone who believes in spiritual gifts, you, are, you have doctrinal pride. Pride. When you treat someone lower than you because they believe differently than you, it is doctrinal pride. It doesn't mean we hold our convictions any less. There are convictions we need to stand strong and say, if they don't believe, repent and believe that you're not a brother. But there are other things that many godly, theologically studied, Bible-believing people for generations have disagreed on talked about and believed. I remember in Bible college, a guy's trying to convince me the theological position. He says, if you would just look at the Greek, it'd be all clear. And I'm like, man, this debate's been happening for like 800 years and no one has thought of that. <laughs> Write a book. One line. Pride of achievement. Scripture shows a cause and effect relationship between hard work and success. Proverbs 13, the soul of a sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We accomplish something, it feels good. You graduate school, it feels good. You get promoted in a job, it feels good. Good, but what we forget is that any success we may have is under the control of God. First Samuel 2, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. We looked at the, the last sin about thankfulness. We give thanks, right, because it is God who ultimately gave us the skills, gave us the abilities to be able to have such achievements the truth is, it's nothing you have, no, no skill, no, nothing special of you. Any opportunities to succeed comes from God. So how do we get prideful on this? We don't acknowledge what God has done, what God has given us. And you may be that person that says, hard work, knowing people, my family, and many other reasons. Right? You hear all the sport guys, what, what do you credit your success? My mama, my my family, my friend's home. You hear nothing about the Lord. But how do we fight this sin? 
When we did something well, when we achieved at our jobs, maybe even having a joy-filled life, serving faithfully at your church. Your response is, I've only done my duty. Luke 17, so you also, when you have done all that you are commanded, say we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was your duty. We recognize that everything comes from God. Everything that we have comes from God. Lastly, the pride of an independent spirit. There's really two areas, right? Resistance to authority or an unteachable attitude. I know when I was a few years ago in college, younger, I thought I knew everything. Freshman through Bible college, and I said, let's go get a church. I'm, I'm good. I don't need anything else. Right? It was a church business class, actually, where I was like, nope. I am not ready for the finance office side. Of, and that scared me enough to be like, you're not ready. You need some time. But we, we want to be teachable. We want to go and make disciples around, among the nations. People have to be teachable. And, and, and some of you here have grown up in church. You've been in the church for years, and you know what it, what it takes. And some may be just starting their journey. They're, they're a few years or maybe a few months into being a believer. But there, there's people in here that are, that are more wise who are trying to make disciples of younger Newer believers, they must be teachable. Proverbs, often, my son, if you receive my words, my son, do not forget my teaching. Hear, O sons of father, instruction. You want to submit to authority, someone who has your best interest in their heart, someone who's more mature and can help you grow. Us young people, we got to respect our elders. The culture is not respecting our elders, but we as believers must respect our elders to hear from them, to hear what they have to say. If we think we know better than them, we're, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Lack of, lack of self-control. Proverbs 25, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A person without self-control is like this city, vulnerable to all kinds of temptations. I think an, an easier one to point out in Scripture is Solomon. He didn't have one wife or two or three. He had 700. And then he had 300 concubines because that wasn't enough. And the, the man who, who asked for wisdom, who asked God, Lord, give me wisdom, no self-control, gave, gave way to his desires, gave way to his, his passions. Self-control is a, a governance or a prudent control of one's desires, cravings, impulses, emotions, passions. Biblical self-control, though, is not something from you. It's not something you can do. And I'm going to be self-controlled today. No, it, it comes from the Lord. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to have self-control. And you can say, well, I'm not overweight, so I don't have that problem. Well, my screen time on my iPhone is only two hours a day. I'm not, I, don't have that, I don't have that problem. I, I make sure to only have one glass of wine a night, so I'm good. I, I have self-control. But as believers... We need to exercise self-control in, in all areas of life. Maybe you need to quit having ice cream stored in the freezer at all times. Maybe you let your temper get out of hand and you have a short fuse. Maybe your finances, your budget policy is whatever the credit card max is, that's the budget. <laughs> self-control of where your eyes are looking these sins tonight, right, we call them acceptable because it's just not something you typically call out in someone. It's something, if there's these boundaries, right, homosexuality is outside the boundary, murder is outside the boundary, transgenderism is outside the boundary, but in the boundary, you may be doing these things and it's just, someone's not going to really come up to you and be like, 
Ron, can you quit gossiping? I know it's good. Like, I, I enjoy the stories, but can we not? It's awkward. I was, just, I was awkward just doing that now. <laughs> yes. But if I, if I came over to your house and I said, hey, you probably need to quit keeping ice cream in your freezer. And, and you're like, why? And I just point at your gut. <laughs> am, I, am I coming over to your house again? No. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to honor God when we exercise self-control in all areas of life. But we pray for one another to have self-control. There are things that we say that we we need to exercise self-control and not say. Like I just gave the example. One more sin tonight. Worldliness. Now, this means different things to different people. If you go to 1 John, it, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. Jerry Bridges defines worldliness as being attached to, engrossed in, or preoccupied with the things of this temporal life. Now, Paul tells the Colossians, the the believers in Colossae, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. The world clearly does not focus on the things that are above. Their minds are set here on the temporal. So where can believers look worldly? Well, I think money is, is an easy one to point out. America in particular, the, the wealthiest nation on earth, 2004, the average household income was $52,287. The average giving to any causes was $794, about one and a half percent. Now, that's just the world. So, believers, maybe it's a little better. 2003, eight evangelical denominations at the time did a survey. Christians were given about 4.4% of their income to God's work. But this survey followed another one that was actually... That survey was higher. This, this 2003 one was worse. So actually, it just, the trend was, was down. And this trend continues in churches where people are giving less, and now the churches themselves are giving less to missions and just spending more money on themselves. Brendan, you don't see tithing in the New Testament. You can't tell me that I have to give 10% to the church. In fact, I don't like when you talk about money. So I don't like when pastor talks about money. I don't like when Ben talks about money. You can't make me give 10%. Tithing's not in the New Testament. You are correct. Tithing is not in the New Testament, the, the 10% at least. But do you think God is pleased that we give half of what the Jews gave? In the Old Testament, you think God is pleased, especially when Malachi 3 8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, How have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? And I even think about it too the Jews were looking forward to the cross. They knew a Messiah was coming, and their obedience was to give 10%, looking forward to someone to save them. And we get to look back. We get to see the Bible in completion, how God's story has laid out. And yet our thankfulness in our giving, 4.4%. And that was 2003, so I didn't look up the number for this year, but I can only imagine the trend has continued down. And I hear if you, if you gave 10% or more of your income today, You would wonder if you had money to eat, if you had the necessary things to live. In the sin of anxiety, you would start to get anxious. 10%, the budget's so tight now. Every dollar is telling me I have negative dollars right now. And I have to ask you, if, if, if we are called not to be anxious, and we're also called to, to give generously, 
because of what God has done for us, will he provide? Will you trust him? 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. This isn't necessarily money rich, though potentially, Lord willing, God blessed you, but our giving reflects the value we placed on the gift of Jesus. And because of what he did, the text says that we might become rich. Immorality. When we partake in movies, music, that the world loves, but the, the entertainment is clearly against the things of the Lord, does God bless that? The way we dress. Now, I know we're, you're, you're like, Brendan, don't, don't attack the women in here. Don't attack their, their, their modesty. I'm, I'm not going to. You, you've heard it. But for men as well, right? And, it, and it's, it's really a shame because a few years ago, the Hillsong pastor in New York gets fired for bad reasons. And what's the first thing I, I hear on Joe Rogan, what, what they are talking about, this big Christian pastor, the way he dresses. And they show a picture. He's shirtless. His shorts are shorter than what most girls wear them. The waistband is farther down than what men typically wear their shorts. And they're like, is he a Christian? Like, he dresses like that? And I'm like, wow. That's something. Unbeliever, atheist, like, from what I could tell, does not think the Lord is real. And he's calling out a Christian for how he dresses, and really a pastor of a church for how immodest they were. And and so I guess my my thing here, our question to to this, to the, the things of the world, whether it's entertainment or whether it's dress or anything else, our question should never be, well, where's the line? How how close can I get? The question should always be, what is most excellent? What pleases, what would please God? Idolatry. And we're I'm not necessarily talking about bowing down to wooden statutes or carved out pieces of stone, it fits, but we're talking here the idols of the heart. A, a job can become an idol. A position or status can become an idol. Our beloved Ohio State Buckeyes can become an idol, right? Any, anything that is not God can become an idol. And are we simply going along and accepting the values and practices of society without even thinking about whether those values and practices would honor God and give glory to him. So where do we go from here? Because I think at least one of these sins you're struggling to fight. One of these sins, maybe you don't even realize it, you are this. And we could have gone through more. But like we said in the beginning, these are subtle sins. We need to pray and ask God to help us see these sins in our life. We have people close to us, brothers and sisters, that we can ask, hey, do you see this in me? Do you see me one who's anxious? Do you see me as one who, who lacks self-control? And we, and we should be able to tell them in love for their good, yes, I, I see this. Yes, I think you might struggle with this. And We've developed these habits of sinning that we need to repent and walk in forgiveness that we have received from Jesus. And we, and we believe, right, that Jesus has done what we could never do, and he obeyed where we couldn't. Pray through each of these sins to ask God if there's evidences of these sins in your life. Becoming more and more like Jesus It's nothing of our power. It's nothing of us, but everything on the person and work of Jesus. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, this beautiful thing called sanctification, for years, maybe, decades, 
being made more and more like Jesus. You are more like Jesus now than when you walked in at seven tonight. And Lord willing, right, everyone in here, he will, Philippians 1, 6, bring it to completion. So any questions? Please don't throw anything at me. <laughs> Pastor's right there, so he's a lot closer, but... Thank you. I, I needed that. <laughs> Small group this week. You can you can pray for him. You just got a prayer request tonight, so. I think uh, for the believer, there's, there's two things that, that we, well, three, but when, when it comes to this matter of sin, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we deal with sin, you know, Romans 6 tells us about how God dealt with our sins, right? The things that we did. Mm-hmm. We have this other problem, and that's sin, right? Sin is not... Sins is not...